This is uh, about testing your development plan before you carry it out and using that testing to optimize your development plan. And we all know that um, we're interested in that because of the high attrition rate of drugs through the development process. So I'm going to talk about dose finding via clinical utility, um, which is a combination of safety and efficacy. Uh, but before that, I'm going to talk about early and late stage drug development program design. And by program, I mean a sequence of trials. The work started on the right-hand side. Um, we were part of an ad a DIA adaptive program working group, and we built, uh, we published a paper uh, on si of a case study in neuropathic pain. Um, where we simulated a development program beginning with the phase two dose finding trial uh, using the clinical, uh, clinically important endpoint. And then that launched into two phase three trials. Um, and, and we tried to optimize that um, using probability of success of the program and the net present value of the compound. And then that work um, got. Um, a big pharma client interested in using a similar approach to simulate early phase uh, program, where you start with a phase one proof of concept trial using several biomarkers, and that might launch into a dose finding trial based on biomarkers, and then based on the results of those two trials, um, you'll make dose choices for phase two and optimize phase two um, with the goal of picking the right dose for phase three. The late phase pro, uh, program uh, optimized based on sample size in phase two and um, various cost factors. Uh, and what we found was um, because naturally you could do a, a very large phase two trial and get the best information, but that wouldn't be cost or time effective. And so the publication points out a sweet spot on sample size where it's just enough to get the right information, but not too much. So that investigation looked at the number of doses, phase two sample sizes, adaptive versus traditional designs, and then number of phase three doses in several configurations and different methods for selecting a dose in order to optimize that program. And we did that via simulating the phase two and phase three sequence of trials. We measured success, we measured probability of success as the, the probability that two phase three trials demonstrated a significant effect um, with a, at least a mean response of, of a certain magnitude. And profit was measured by net present value and the optimization was based on simulating multiple scenarios, and um, the magnitude of profit was determined by a relationship between efficacy and tolerability uh, measured by a clinical utility function. And so that clinical utility function approach served as the basis for another consulting project we did um, with a, a small pharma company um, for their phase two trial. So I'm going to talk more about the early phase uh, sequence of trial simulation and that adaptive phase two trial, which was a separate effort uh, based on clinical utility. Uh, this is a schematic of, of the simulation uh, for, of the late phase project. Starting with phase two, it launched into either phase three trials with one dose, two doses, or three doses. And, and then there were decision stopping criteria after each or go criteria toward filing. And the evaluation was based on did we make the right decision to stop or go? And if we did go, did we get the phase three dose choice right? And did we optimize probability of success in that present value? And then future work um, involves adding an additional phase three trial after the results of those initial phase three trials in case we did not get sufficient dose finding information to separate 
the multiple dose situations. So we found that uh, these factors could be optimized, the, the ones that I mentioned. Next. The early development program um, aimed to optimize that sequence of trials that I mentioned in the beginning. And in particular, how could the relationship between the biomarkers and the clinical endpoint be leveraged to optimize that early development plan? Um, so the optimization criteria were picking the right dose at the end of phase 2B and uh, picking the right sample sizes. Next. So this is that schematic. Uh, one approach was to only do a biomarker proof of concept trial and have a rapid to 2B uh, criteria and then conduct the phase two trial with the clinical endpoint and then have another criteria uh, which had to be satisfied in order to go to phase three. And the key question was, did we make the right dose choice? Um, and, and did we make the right choice of stopping or going? Next. We had another option of doing a biomarker dose finding trial and then analyzing the two biomarker trials together in order to better inform the design of the phase two trial. So we evaluated that option as well. And again, the same criteria. So now we have several configurations of this early development program, and, and the question is what works best for the clinical situation. Next. What we found in this particular example was that the biomarker trial was very useful for proof of concept, but the dose-finding biomarker trial was not useful for improving the probability of picking the right dose. The correlation between the biomarkers and the clinical endpoint was not precise enough to yield a good dose finding decision. So this aimed, this enabled the sponsor to skip that biomarker dose finding trial and go directly to phase 2B. Um, so they could then repurpose that trial, move it off the clinical path, and, and use it for gathering other information like what time of day, once a day versus twice a day. Next. The last thing I'll talk about is a two-stage adaptive phase two combined proof of concept and dose finding trial, um, which was focused on optimizing clinical utility, that is finding the dose that gave the best balance between tolerability and efficacy. Stage A of this uh, trial was primarily for proof of concept, but also to inform uh, the adaptive sta uh, stage B dose finding trial. So there were uh, four doses included in stage A, plus an active control, plus placebo. So this enabled a futility decision as well, and also some dose finding to kick off the second stage, which was meant to um, optimize the clinical utility, uh, which I'll talk about in subsequent slides. We used the maximizing design by, uh, published by Anastasia Ivanova in 2010 um, to adaptively assign doses um, to maximize clinical utility. This design starts with two doses. Um, that are chosen from stage A, and then patients are randomized in sequential cohorts of about 25, uh, depending on the enrollment rate. And each stage B cohort then is, is randomized to placebo, two doses, and active control. And the doses for the sequential cohorts are uh, selected according to the adaptive design. Next. The clinical utility function was constructed, um, as shown on this slide. Uh, increasing tolerability um, is on the left-hand columns, and the first column there is um, the tolerability of, of, of control it, it is better for treatment, which is 
has similar tolerability to placebo and better than active control. And then the second column is where the test treatment has tolerability between placebo and active control. The third column is um, treatment and control have similar tolerability, um, worse than placebo. A and then the worst case is when the test treatment has worse tolerability than even the, co the, control treat the active control treatment. And then their corresponding rows uh, for efficacy, the, the same uh, qualitative um, uh, comparison to control and placebo. So the, the, the least clinical utility is the upper right corner, and we, we graded that zero, and we graded the best possible response um, as 100. And then next slide, together with the clinical team, um, w the clinical team actually defined the clinical utility um, in graded uh, increments um, to fill in the cells. And then we also had quantitative uh, measures associated with each column and each row so that when we got actual numeric results for the tolerability endpoint and the um, efficacy endpoint, we could go in and, and, and via interpolation estimate what the actual tolerability was and use that information to do the adaptation per the adaptive design. Next. Um, an earlier talk uh, covered the information on this slide, um, which just says we assess the adaptive design performance via simulation. So we did simulation study for uh, actually 14 uh, configurations of efficacy and safety, um, efficacy and tolerability dose response curves. And, and then the results are, are summarized verbally on, on the next slide, I think. What we found for those 14 potential true dose response curves is that over 50% of the simulations yielded correct estimates of the target dose. And those percents ranged from 58% to 98%. The median was close to 90%. So the adaptive design was doing really well at identifying um, the, the correct dose. And over 91% of the simulations yielded estimated target dose at or adjacent to the correct target. Um, then uh, the other factor with which we uh, chose the adaptive design was to allocate the most subjects at or adjacent to the true target dose. And uh, across all 14 potential dose response configurations, um, at least five and up to 70% more patients were allocated to the target dose uh, or adjacent to the target dose compared to an equal allocation design. So this was justification for using the adaptive design based on a uh, clinical utility endpoint. And there was never fewer patients. This trial is being implemented adaptively at this time. The trial has started, and it's using um, an automated access system to keep um, the uh, the, the, the clinical monitoring um, blinded and record uh, all of the unblinded accesses um, for the team who's guiding the adaptation. So in summary, next. Early and late phase development programs, namely sequences of clinical trials, can be optimized. Um, and, the, and they can be optimized to maximize probability of success, net present value, and clinical utility. Um, adaptive dose finding designs based on clinical utility could be used to optimize identification of doses for phase three relative to active comparator and placebo. Um, and, and dose finding adaptive designs are um, evaluated via simulation. Uh, similarly, uh, computer simulation can be used to optimize drug supply and, be, and can be used to uh, predict patient recruitment and forecast the occurrence of clinical events. Um, and then 
as part of the go, no go criteria between those clinical trials, we used Bayesian posterior probability calculations to assist those go, no go decisions that could be employed in development programs as well. Um, and in that way, research budget allocation um, can be uh, also optimized across a portfolio of compounds. Uh, and that could be done by a simulation. And then there are references. I have to say, this is the first time in my experience where we've had three back-to-back -back sessions among such a senior level audience talking about adaptive uh, trial designs. And it really feels like the appetite that companies have for using adaptive designs has really increased dramatically. Can you talk about uh, how it might vary by company size and what might be driving that, that appetite? Um, I agree with the statistic earlier, about 20%. Um, some big pharma clients uh, have even greater percentages of adaptive designs. Um, for small company clients, there's a little bit more caution, uh, particularly in the late stage. Um, one client I work with in Big Pharma has about 40% of their late stage trials with some adaptive component. Um, smaller companies might be a little bit more hesitant, but they are very open to early phase adaptation because as was stated earlier. So what is the reason why late stage uh, tends to be a place, especially for smaller companies? Uh, is it reflected in the uh, need for more expertise among uh, CROs or? Uh... One aspect is that there's more lead time needed and, and, and there should be a regulatory guide, uh, a regulatory interaction uh, for late stage adaptive design consideration. And so the need for that regulatory review of the study design when it's adaptive can be thought to slow things up for small companies. Oh, but I if see. there's enough lead time, uh, then it's, they're more open. So you're, you're out there, you're consulting with a lot of companies. Um, where do you see the greatest misunderstanding within organizations about the use of adaptive uh, designs? Uh, I think the, the, the biggest misconception is that adaptive design, um, that they, they, there should be a, a need to do adaptive designs. And uh, before one considers an adaptive design, one needs to go through a, a, an assessment of the logistics of the situation to make sure the logistics of the clinical trial situation are appropriate for an adaptive design. And then one needs to compare the performance characteristics of potential adaptive designs with traditional uh, non-adaptive designs in order to justify um, taking on the logistical challenges for an adaptive design. And if, if uh, the performance characteristics are, are better, much better for an adaptive design, then that probably should be the choice. But in some cases where there's only a minor incremental gain for adaptive, then maybe a simpler traditional design um, is, is, is a, an approach that a client would take. We, the, uh, that 20% statistic uh, comes <coughs> from your working group, the DIA working group. and uh, Yeah, one of my colleagues is part of that. And we corroborated that finding at the Tufts Center, mm -hmm. and, but we, the 20% statistic only applies to real simple adaptations, right? Like uh, sample size reestimation and, and early uh, termination. The, the more advanced uh, adaptive designs, like a dose response assessment, is probably lower. Is that your sense? Or are you, uh, uh, are you seeing that picking up? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know, because um, I've done multiple adaptive design proposals for small companies, and um, some of those have not been fruitful um, in, in that the client has not chosen to either work with us or implement that adaptive design for one reason or another. Um, so I, I don't know what the true uptake is. On, on the out, on, on the client side. We, we hear that uh, some of the biggest pain points now in companies come from clinical operations, that mm -hmm. uh, the big fear... Particularly drug supply. Right. And can you comment on companies that have, that have adopted adaptive designs well, how are they able to manage 
some of those operating disruptions? I, I, I do some consulting with Merck, and uh, it's known that Merck um, has, an, has an internal cross-functional adaptive working group. Um, and they're actually published a paper on the logistical aspects of adaptive designs. And, th and that team includes drug supply people, includes patient recruitment people. And um, those drug supply folks who are part of that working group have become advocates for it and have helped to um, overcome the logistical issues um, that, and challenges that are presented for uh, drug supply in particular. So some of it comes from forecasting, right, and actually getting those people yeah. at the table. And having forecasting tools so that, you know, they can actually um, get a feel for how much excess is going to be needed. Um, historically, they may have prepared for every possible outcome, and um, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily so that you need to prepare for every outcome because uh, you can buy a simulation um, across a spectrum of potential uh, true dose response curves hone in on the actual increment above what you need for a traditional design. So the, the best selling point for companies that are considering an adaptive design may not necessarily be the cost savings associated with uh, uh, early termination, right? That's right. The, there, the three factors work against one another, and, and those factors are cost, uh, time, and quality of information. And you, you can never achieve uh, improvement of all three of those versus a traditional design. Most of the cases hold cost and uh, time similar and improve on quality of information. And, and the quality of information, if it especially leads to a higher success Better rate. Better decision making right. for the same cost and time. That incrementally could have a much bigger impact than any of the direct costs you might save. Yeah. There study. was a DIA uh, presentation by a colleague who, who I worked with on that ADAPT group at Merck where they took 22 or 20 some adaptive designs and went back and costed out the time, the cost, of a, a, an equivalent traditional design. A, and they found that in almost all of those cases, um, there, <clears throat> there was a resource gain, uh, there was a, um, a, a gain in one of those three. Uh, and they quantified that for, the, for those 22, and, and, and that's a slide set that's publicly available through DIA. Merck, uh, Lilly, GSK have sort of been leading the charge, and I, I, I believe that Merck, in fact, and J&J as well, <clears throat> I believe that in some of these organizations, half of their portfolio is now using some uh, adaptive design component. The, the, the number in, in Merck, which, with which I'm most familiar, is about 40, and that's just late stage. That's just late stage. Two and three. How, how <clears throat> let's project out five to seven years, how high uh, a proportion of the portfolio could actually benefit by an adaptive design. Well, Merck has been tracking for the last four or five years, and it's been a kind of a constant around 40. That, that's, I'm only familiar with their with their, statistic. With that portfolio. Yeah. So let's open it up to the group. We have just a few minutes left. Any questions for Jim, either based on material he presented or other burning questions you have about adaptive design use in, in your organization or even uh, agency receptivity, right? We do have a draft guidance issued. When will that become formal? Probably. I'll be surprised <laughs> if it does. If it ever does. <laughs> but, but it's an exceedingly useful document and, and it, it, it documents FDA's current thinking. Right, and there's so much of a focus on improvements in success rates as a primary driver, early stage use of adaptive designs, and the importance of the line of sight, the simulation planning, and really uh, thinking through all your adaptations long before the protocol has been approved. Yeah, we found in particular that not looking only at a particular protocol, but where that protocol fits in the development process 
uh, in the development program, that is the sequence of trials, and simulating that sequence can be highly informative. I don't see many organizations doing the program level adaptive design. Uh, Neither do I. Do. Um, as I mentioned, the first uh, late phase project was a DIA adaptive working group that has published four case studies in I four see. different therapeutic areas. And, and that early phase program is the only one that I know of um, where we actually did it for, for a client. Any, any comments or questions for Jim? Uh, yeah, thank you. This is a very interesting uh, <clears throat> discussion. Uh, did you do any adaptations where direct concentrations go into the equation, maybe by adjusting the dose to achieve a certain exposure level or something like that? We talked about that, but I don't know an example yet. Um, one of the logistical challenges is turning around the assay of the sample in a, in a in a timely fashion in order to inform the adaptation. But that's clearly a, a possible gain um, uh, f f for the improvement of uh, performance characteristics that adaptive design can use. Maybe this is too simplistic a question, but um, suppose you have a phase three design and the control group winds up doing a whole lot better than you actually anticipated it was going to. It, how big a deal is it to do an adaptive design that can account for that um, change and, and recalculate your sample size? That, that, that's one of the key benefits of an adaptive design. If you build in, in particular, a sample size reestimation when the control group changes uh, or is different from what you expect, uh, adaptive design affords the opportunity to make the corrective action necessary to accommodate that. And that's a really simple thing to do? It's pretty straightforward, yeah. Thanks. Do you have experience with approvals that are based on adaptive, um, on studies that are uh, based on adaptive designs? Uh, we have a couple inside our company, three, yeah. I work principally in early phase adaptive, um, but but there are th my colleagues have worked on and the three. I spy example, of course, yeah, you and that one as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess part of one of the things that I struggle with is the definition of adaptive because things like sample size reestimation, um, you know, these types of things have been going on for years and years prior to the definition of adaptive. So you can do um, safety. You can do. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do and. Um, I've been around a lot of drugs uh, uh, that um, have had all, that have been approved that have all, had all sorts of inter-protocol changes. The important thing, obviously, is you put it in the protocol. Pre-plan, right, right. looking That's sort of uh, key. Prospectively. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even the classic group sequential design is classified as an adaptive approach. You could you could count the standard early phase dose escalation designs as adaptive as well, because before you increase the dose, you look at the safety information to see if it's okay. I think, Ken, you were saying that those are most of what you found is proof sequential and dose escalation. That's right. So two uh, somewhat related questions. The first one is, you know, in situations where you may go from a proof of concept based on a biological endpoint, where the time frame to demonstrate an impact on the biological endpoint is, say, two weeks, but the time frame required to demonstrate a clinical endpoint could be a year. Mm -hmm. So kind of making that, you don't have the, really the opportunity for the intermediate step, and so you're in the situation where you need to make the leap. It brings me to the second question, the statistical price uh, that you pay, and you know whether you've had any uh, experience in discussions with the FDA about how they're viewing uh, that, that part of the equation? I haven't had experience in discussion of that, but um, the quality of the information that established is the correlation between that early biomarker and the late phase endpoint is very important. And, and, and building a simulation that can account for that correlation um, can give you confidence that you're going to get the right answer, or it will show that there's not sufficient correlation there to trust it. 
That, that's what we found in that case, that it was good for proof of concept, but you wouldn't want to pick dose based on that. Ken, you, you showed some data previously around the impact that amendments have on performance, cost, uh, site behavior, and I think that this is a place where there's a large impact pre-stating what your trial changes are going to be. Do we have any data around how that this impacts amendments and the percentage of studies that... So, uh, so it's an interesting question. Uh, we went into a recent study thinking that by having that, all the pre-planning and having it approved prior to uh, the protocol is finalized, that you would reduce the number of amendments dramatically. And that didn't happen quite that way. There were still plenty of amendments uh, after uh, the trial had been uh, underway. So I'm not sure that that kind of uh, the scenario planning and the uh, pre-approval does away with uh, modifications to the protocol once it's being conducted. Yeah, per the definition of adaptive design, it's pre-planned adaptations and usually amendments result from unplanned things that you see. I have a feeling you, you were laughing, meaning you already knew the answer to that uh, question. Yeah, well, it's interesting because you, you know, I, I didn't know the answer to that question. The other thing was, <laughs> so it was a planned question. Uh, but uh, the other thing that uh, is that um, regulatory authorities outside the United States are not as accommodative with these kind of approaches. And although you've pre-planned these adaptations in the protocol, a lot of the regulatory authorities outside the U.S. are making you submit them as amendments anyway, making you modify the informed consents and making you uh, make this a substantial amendment, even though it's in the protocol. They're actually making you take out the original stuff and amend the protocol so it doesn't save you outside point. the United States, which becomes a real issue. So it's a yeah. way of uh, having them to be able to learn about the data as it's accumulating. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it becomes a problem. So, so although you would anticipate this would impact amendments, it doesn't seem to do it that much. And if this is a plan to do that, you don't gain that. Well, let's, uh, let's hear it for Jim. Thank you so much for a My pleasure. conversation.